So in the last video we looked at the first two of the three marks of existence being Anika and Ataman, which um, loosely translate to impermanence and the, the emptiness or interconnectivity doctrines. Now these are, we saw, logically necessary, that we cannot imagine a universe with uh, I, we cannot imagine a consistent universe with change that doesn't have Anika and Ataman. The third third mark of existence that the Buddha discovered is slightly different from that. It, it, it is necessarily true of this universe and all universes like it, but it's not a logical necessity because we can imagine a universe that is infinite um, in terms of its possibility in which case the things things although although every system changes systems don't have to end so you can imagine a system I, I like to think like a Mandelbot set or something that just goes on and on and on and on and on so that's a kind of mathematical universe that that doesn't have any end but if the universe is finite either in terms of its its bounds of possibility or like our universe, our, our universe is essentially infinite in many ways but in terms of the speed of light and the fact that we, we, there are energy requirements for activities, um, our universe is, is finite in terms of the, the possibility spaces available to it. So once you have a finite possibility space you have this third truth, this third mark of existence and that is that any system will inevitably end, which is distinct from the impermanence system. The, the, sorry, the distinct from the impermanence in the sense of change. This is impermanence in the sense of ending. So if you can imagine all the possible, possible changes a system could have in terms of its persistence th through the sequence of its states, eventually we know that it's going to, because of the, the finite nature of its, of its kind of in, enclosing environment, we know that it is going to end. And that is its um, conceptual environment, not its not its necessarily physical environment. So, what this means is that every system will naturally tend towards its own non-existence. That it, it can't be any other way. Now, this fact is realised in, in in our universe in all kinds of ways, in terms of decay and and. Um, tending towards entropy and diminishing returns on, on um, experiences and, and all of these kind of things are related to the fact that we have um, imper that we have impermanence realized within a finite possibility space and this is the seed of the third mark of existence which is the four, four noble truths this is the seed of that and, and that is dukkha the, the the fact that every system inevitably tends towards its own non-existence is is the root of human suffering. Now, as I said in the last talk, um, the way that Dharma works isn't any one of these three marks of existence, it's how the three doctrines kind of relate to each other as they become higher in abstraction. So Dukkha, as we experience it um, in, ter in kind of like the tr tr traditional Buddhist sense, is taken as being literally suffering and it is and it or unsatisfactoriness and it is related and it is not that is not equivalent to this seed of dukkha that I'm talking about now because other things come in and those other things are emptiness so it is the fact that all it is the fact that all systems that uh, all systems are empty means um, that all systems that can contemplate their existence are going to contemplate that emptiness. So this is another point. So kind of suffering comes from two points. It comes from the inevitable negativity and the emptiness. And why this happens, I think this is this is what the Buddha showed in, in terms of dependent origination, in terms of the solution to to the, 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 the inevitable suffering that is caused by craving, is that the 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 sense of the sufferer, the sense of the of the the system experiencing this inevitable negativity, is itself an illusion. So there is the illusion of persistence, and there is the illusion of the experiencer of pers persistence. And it's the play between these two points that that is dukkha in the in the traditional Buddhist sense. But which what is important to see, I think, is how these three concepts come from the very simple facts about changing consistent finite finite universes like ours that that anika and ataman dukkha couldn't be any other way in any university is even remotely logically similar to this so you no know, 
in a sense they are really really trivial facts it's it's not like i don't i've tried, I've tried for a long time to doubt them it's not like they can be doubted they are kind of like complete no-brainers again what um what the buddha did with dharma was he kind of followed on from these simple facts and saw how they 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 interact with human experience and how they condition human experience and that is um that in a sense is what the practice of the noble eightfold path is it is understanding and remedying these inevitable consequences that that start from way down in in the same way as um you know radiation sickness and all the sorrow it may cause um, to to families um, or what have you, it, it, that has its roots in in these kind of key simple facts about radiation down, you know, way down, and it, it's the same with the Dharmic truth. They have these profound effects on on the the quality of human experience, but they come from these simple, three logical um, conditions that are true of all realities like this. So that's by no means a kind of um, complete capturing. Of, of the three marks and especially not of, of dukkha and how that affects us but I think it's it could be a starting point for anyone who's kind of philosophically minded to have a look into how these dharmic concepts affect us and how they are completely um, I, I can't doubt them I, I can't see how, how we could and I've tried so there you go that is the foundations of dharma in two little nutshells <laughs>